Tonight on this special edition of 60 Minutes Presents, going to extremes. Three, two, one, hold the base. There he goes. A small group of extreme sportsmen wearing specially made wingsuits have come about as close to flying as you can get outside the confines of an airplane, at least for a minute or two. You can hear them already. Whoa. That was probably about 140, 150 mile an hour flyby. Right when he pulls into that crack, that's like the point of no return. It becomes world class right there. I don't even like the sound of that, the point of no return. Alex Honnold is 2,600 feet above the Yosemite Valley floor, trying to haul himself up the slippery granite wall of Sentinel without any ropes or safety harnesses. It's just the climber, an impossible angle, and the wind. It's called free solo, and the penalty for error is certain death. Mike Rudson is one of just a few people in the world who would do this with a great white shark. And that's just for starters. Whoa. Oh my god! <laughs> that's Whoa. what we're talking about. With blood in the water, and great whites swirling around, he gets in with them. No cage, no protection. How does he survive it, and what could possibly be his motivation? How do you feel? Feel good. We went in the water with him to find out. Good evening. I'm Steve Croft, and welcome to 60 Minutes Presents. There are in this world people driven to take risks, and we've met many of them over the years on 60 Minutes. Where most people see fear, these adventurers seek fulfillment by going to extremes. Tonight, a few of our favorites. For hundreds of years, fully grown adults and very young children have dreamed about flying. People have made wings out of feathers and wood and jumped off buildings and cliffs in order to soar like a bird and a lot of them have died trying. Now a small group of extreme sportsmen wearing specially made wingsuits have come about as close as you can get to flying outside the confines of an airplane, at least for a minute or two. Some people call them birdmen. We first learned about them on the internet. The pictures we saw were so spectacular, we decided a couple of years ago to assemble some of the sport's top athletes and mount a small expedition with the latest high-definition cameras to one of the most beautiful places on Earth to see what this is all about. Three, two, one, on the base. There he goes. He's going to come around the corner. Oh, he's high. Nice. Can you hear him already? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> J.T. Holmes is an American, a professional skier from Lake Tahoe. Man, they've got like little goosebumps from that speed, eh? <laughs> Julian Boole is a South African living in France, a skydiver and aerial photographer par excellence. And that's Tom Eric Hyman, one of our Norwegian hosts darting across the valley. I just love just, you know, feeling that speed and watching stuff go by. And how fast are you going? That was probably about 140, 150 mile an hour flyby. That sound is amazing to me. Did you feel it? Yeah. It's so cool to watch. I can just... If you want to do this, there is no better time or place than the Ramsdal Valley of Norway during the summer solstice, a paradise of fjords and farms several hundred miles northwest of Oslo. Myth has it that Norway's trolls live here amidst the waterfalls and some of the tallest, sheerest cliffs in Europe. Norwegians have been parachuting off them for decades. Birdmen take the extreme sport to new extremes, dropping off a cliff and free-falling until the air inflates the wings of their nylon suits and propels them forward. The dive creates the speed and you use that speed to glide out and, you know, fly flatter. Gravity makes it impossible for them to go up or even maintain altitude. 
For every two feet JT glides forward, he drops a foot. But the suit allows him to stay aloft three times longer than a skydiver. Within a few seconds, of course, that, that suit, that wind is going to fill up that suit, it's going to pressurize, and you're going to have total control. How long have you been doing this? Uh, five years. What's special about the wingsuits? Mm. You know, it, it's, it's, it's just like so many children dream. It's flying. You feel like you're flying? Well, I am flying. <laughs> so yes, I do very much feel like I'm flying. Like a bird? Yeah, just like a bird. A bird that can't flap his wings and go up. The birds probably laugh at us. They're probably just like, look at these guys. They have long grown bored of simply flying over the valleys. In order to maximize the sensation of speed, they need a visual reference point, so they fly just a few feet from the rock face. You're, sometimes you're flying so close to these cliffs, it looks like you could reach out and touch them. And you're going 100 miles an hour, 140 miles an hour? Yeah. There's it, not much margin feels, for air. There. It, it feels entirely in control, and the speed actually increases your stability, and it increases your safety margin, because with the speed that we're flying with, you can uh, create lift, and you know you can pop up and fly away at any time. That, there's margin there. Ready, set, go! How quickly can you turn? I don't even know how to turn. You just do it. You just, you know, you just look where you want to go and, and you just go there. And then you just, just feel it. And go. You're like, yeah, let's go fast. This feels good. The faster I go, the more control I have. And you just charge with it. To the extent that JT and the others ever get nervous, it usually comes at a time that many people might consider one of the most mundane legs of the trip when the end is in sight. What is the most dangerous part of this? The most important thing is to open that parachute. You know, just that moment when you reach back and throw the pilot chute out there, which extracts your parachute, that's the most critical thing. I mean, if you don't do that, you're not going to live through it. But getting down the mountain, which only takes a minute or so, is just part of the extreme sport. The much longer and more arduous part involves scaling the mountains you're going to jump off in the first place. How long does it take you to get up to the ledge where you go from? This, this one's about an hour and a half, but uh, you know some of them are up to four, five, six hours for the big, big mountains around here. There are no chairlifts, which explains why JT, Julian, and Tom Eric are members of such a small and exclusive club. You have to be a skilled climber, an accomplished skydiver, and an experienced outdoorsman to even attempt to do this. You know, it's, it's that first view looking over the edge that really uh, hits you. You're like, whoa, cool. This is an amazing spot to fly. Money can't buy you this experience. You've got to have the passion mm -hmm. to do your time. If you haven't done the time, you just can't get there. You can't arrive with like $10,000 and buy wingsuit experience. What do you have to know? What kind of skills do you have to have to be able to do what you do? You need to just have some mountain sense. You know, what, how long am I going to be? What if, if something goes wrong? How long is it going to be until I can get back? If the weather comes in, how, you need to know yourself. How much water do I need? Can I realistically walk up this mountain for two hours? Or is that not within my physical capabilities? Yesterday I jumped from... It all looks spontaneous, but the Birdman put together a detailed plan every time they jump. There's still some fog coming in. And they almost always have help from the locals, who serve as spotters, keeping them posted on weather conditions and potential problems on the ground. You ever get spooked up there? I have, yeah. In, in, on, on a couple of occasions, I've had no real good reason for not, not jumping, but I just walked back down. We're trying to get people to understand that we're not crazy. We just want to have fun like everybody else. We want to share nature. Like everyone else, we just have our own special way of doing it. If you die bear jumping, it is your own fault. It is your own mistakes that makes that happen. Do you think about it? I mean, when you're up there on the top of the mountain, you're getting ready to go, and you all shake hands and say, yeah. do you think about the possibility? We don't, we, yeah, but we, we don't go. think like, oh, no. I might not see you again. I better, <laughs> say, <laughs> better say goodbye. Give me a kiss. No, Let's uh, see this. Uh, that never enters your mind. No. Come on. If you do crash when you're flying your wingsuit, you're, you're going to die. Nobody lives through that. Uh, you're just going too fast.
JT was just 15 when his dad took him helicopter skiing. Today, he's one of the best in the world at it, making a living endorsing products and making movies for top-of-the-line production companies like MSP Films. You're a professional skier. Yeah. Yeah, great job. I mean, in your day job, you could, there are any number of ways you could kill yourself in your day job. Uh, and for fun, you take on something that's maybe even more dangerous? Um, yeah, I, I do dangerous things. He and his friend Shane McConkey were the first to ski off mountains wearing their wingsuits. Then they jettisoned their skis so they could fly down the mountain. You lost a good friend recently. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Shane. Uh huh. He was he was supposed to be with us here. Yeah, he was. We uh, planned this trip to meet up with you guys. Then I took off to Europe. That was when he died. You were with him. Yep. Shane crashed in Italy because he was unable to release his ski bindings quickly enough so he could begin flying. How did it affect you? It saddened me deeply. You know, I miss my friend. Did it make you think about quitting? Yeah. But you did. No. No, I, I didn't. I didn't. Didn't quit. I. Uh, at least I haven't quit yet. Near the end of our stay, we chartered a helicopter for the biggest adventure of our visit. We were going to the top of one of the most famous mountains in Norway, Ramstelsborg. When JT and the others climb up here, they don't even use ropes. The chopper saved us time and energy. It was a dizzying flight, not for the faint-hearted. From the air, our landing pad looked tiny but solid, a flat piece of rock. But when we touched down, it turned out to be an unstable patchwork of stone. You guys said that this was like the size of two football fields. This is like the size of a NBA basketball court. For a summit, it's huge. <laughs> you could throw a party up here for New Year's Eve. <laughs> I'm busy New Year's Eve. Okay. <laughs> it was early summer, but we were a mile above the valley floor, and the temperature was just above freezing. Kind of half the battle just getting in these things, though. You, know? you kind of feel like you're climbing into the, a tight cockpit. They had a pre-flight checklist, making sure their zippers were closed, parachutes well packed, and there were no rips in their wingsuits. It was time to go to what they call the exit point. So you're having fun? Yeah, I'm enjoying myself. I wish I could say the same thing. I'm not crazy about heights. <laughs> By his count, JT has jumped off mountains like this 125 times but there is a bit of the first time every time he does it. Okay. I feel, you know, kind of butterflies in my stomach and you, you just feel like a flow of adrenaline. Tom Eric and his Norwegian friend Espen were the first to take the plunge. Okay. See ya. Yeah. Sweet. So are you psyched right now? Yeah. That's the way For to describe sure. it. Pump. Yeah. You're pumped. Yeah, I'm fired up. I want to go. Can I go? <laughs> we decided not to follow JT down the last few steps to the ledge where he was going to jump. And we were glad we didn't. He then collected himself and took a couple of deep breaths. You ever have trouble pulling the trigger? Okay, we're ready. No, no, I don't. But, you know, you do sometimes have trouble finding that calm moment. You know, and you're just like, okay, well, this is about as calm as I'm going to get this time. Okay. Ready, set, go. You know, you, you step off and it's, it's like you're an astronaut. You're just weightless and then you start to fall and you get the wind and that's when you're gaining speed. And I really enjoy that part. You know, air is air and gravity is gravity. You know, you're, you're carving through just beautiful stuff. Yeah. For some of these pictures, Julian was our cameraman and at one point he and JT were flying so close together in such perfect formation that there was time for a Birdman high five half a mile up at 140 miles an hour. It was an exhilarating moment, but it wasn't the last. Woo! Over the next few days, they kept on jumping, saving the best for last. Ready, set, go! And you're just flying along the, the, the wall on your right. And at that point, I don't really know what's going on. Is, is Julian there or not? I assume he is because he's so good, but on this jump, I can see our shadows, and I'm like, oh, yeah, he's right there, he's right there. 
Every jump is like a little mini adventure. These are experiences that I only want to share with people that I love and respect. Thanks. Yeah, buddy, good trip. Good trip. Huh? We've done it again. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think anybody else had much fun as us today in the entire world? I don't, I don't think so. I really don't I, think I, so. I don't think it's possible. Uh -uh. No. Coming up, scaling rock walls higher than the Empire State Building without a rope. From time to time, we come across someone who can do something so remarkable that it defies belief and in this case, seems to defy gravity. It's the story of Alex Honnold. He's a 26-year-old rock climber from Sacramento, California, but not just any rock climber. Honnold scales walls higher than the Empire State Building, and he does it without any ropes or protection. It's a kind of climbing called free soloing, and the penalty for air is certain death. We first heard about him in a movie called Alone on the Wall a harrowing account of one of his most extraordinary feats, the first free solo climb up the northwest face of Half Dome, a towering 2,000-foot wall in Yosemite National Park. This past summer, Laura Logan met up with Alex at Yosemite to watch what he does firsthand. What you're about to see is someone holding onto a wall thousands of feet above the ground with nothing to stop him if he falls. Here, Alex Honnold is 2,600 feet above the Yosemite Valley floor, trying to haul himself up the slippery granite wall of Sentinel. He's so high, he disappears into the mountain. Alex moves seamlessly across a section of flaky, unstable rock, pausing to dry a sweaty hand in his bag of chalk. There's nothing but him, the wall, and the wind. He's up here without ropes or a safety harness. All he has is a pair of rubber climbing shoes. This is what climbers call free soloing, and it's so dangerous that less than 1% of people who climb attempt it. Do you feel the adrenaline at all? There is no adrenaline rush. You know, like if I get a rush, it means that something has gone horribly wrong, you know, because the whole thing should be pretty slow and controlled and like, I mean, it's mellow. Does the challenge appeal to you? Yeah, for sure or being able to, like always being able to push yourself, like always having something bigger to do or harder to do, or any time you finish a climb, there's always the next thing that you can try. This is Alex in the film Alone on the Wall. He's done more than a thousand free solo climbs, but none were tougher than this one. Here he is, just a speck on the northwest face of Half Dome. You can barely make out the Yosemite Valley floor below as he pauses to rest. He's the only person known to have free soloed the northwest face of Half Dome. What do you consider Alex's greatest achievements to date? That he's still alive. If you look at the past, people that have made a real habit of soloing, you know, at least half of them are dead. In the 70s, John Long was one of the best rock climbers in the world. Today, he's an elder statesman in the climbing community. It's indescribable what it's like to be up real high because, you know, but you. You can get some kind of idea about it just by walking to the edge of a cliff or the edge of a building. You look over and your body, has, you have a visceral sort of effect. You know, you can dial it off with a lot of experience, but not all the way off. So well, you all... just lose your stomach. Yeah. And the, the, pro, the, the real challenge about climbing without a rope is the fact is that feeling can come up full bore in a split second. And you have to control that. Yeah, you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna have to dial that one back really quickly. Or else? Your diaphragm is going to close. You're not going to be able to breathe. If you have no chance, you're going to die. Alex learned how to control his fear at this climbing gym near his home in Sacramento, California, when he was just a boy. Kind of funny coming back. I remember it being like a big cave. For seven years, this is where he came three hours a day, six days a week. He would climb until he was exhausted, then read old climbing magazines. That's all I was ever interested in, really. Your whole I mean, life? Yeah, from when I started climbing, from when I was maybe 10 or 11. I don't, I don't even remember when. It was so long ago. But, but, I mean, that's all I ever was into, really. Back then, he was a shy, skinny kid with big ears. 
Today, he's still skinny, but his 5 foot 11 inch frame is 160 pounds of muscle. For someone his size, he has big hands. They have to carry his whole body weight when he's hanging off the rock. Yeah, I have pretty big fingers, so it's hard to get it into a thin crack. Show me. Were they like this before you started climbing? I don't think they were quite this big before I started climbing. I think that, I honestly think my connective tissue and stuff has like gone, like they've just Bigger? all just gotten beefier, you know. Yeah. I think it's all the like crack climbing, like torquing your fingers in different ways. Would you take a picture with our team? <laughs> Alex has acquired something akin to rock star status in the climbing world, where he always draws a crowd. He made the cover of National Geographic. He's also in a nationwide ad campaign for the company The North Face. But the kid who dropped out of college and stole the family minivan to go climbing has been slow to cash in on his success. So this is really your home? Yeah, this is, when I'm in the U.S., this is mostly my, my home, you know. It's pretty comfortable, it's pretty cozy, you know, it's easy to move around. Do you just park on the side of a road? Yeah. Do you go days without showering? Yeah, of course. That's Almost everything Alex owns is in this van. He survives on less than a thousand dollars a month. You can go anywhere. You know, tomorrow morning I could wake up and I could drive to the East Coast and then climb there for the next two months. He doesn't like to admit he's any good, which is why he's known to his friends as Alex No Big Deal. You know, I'm not a very powerful climber. I'm more of an endurance climber, like I climb these big long routes. Is there anyone else in the world right now who can do what Alex Honnold can do? I think there's probably a handful of people who possibly could get close to what he's doing. He's by probably unquestionably the best guy alive today. To capture Alex free soloing Sentinel, we assembled a six-man team of experienced climbers who would film at different positions along the route. We attached four more cameras to the wall and two 60 Minutes teams set up on the valley floor. But as the climb got closer, Alex got restless. So the day before, he snuck off with his friend Peter Mortimer, an adventure filmmaker, to do something that would calm his nerves. He climbed an impossible vertical wall called the Phoenix. I never would have agreed to go out there with like a bunch of people. It just would be craziness. And uh, honestly, you guys wouldn't want to see it. Like, it would be weird. It would be weird? Yeah. Why? What would be weird it would, about it? I don't know, I think it would blow your mind. It'd be weird. Like, just the position is outrageous. This is what he means by weird. Look at the angle of this wall. It's more than 90 degrees and covered with mist from a nearby waterfall. The route itself is only around 115 feet long, but the cracks are so thin, his fingertips could barely fit inside them. Towards the top of the climb, the angle of the wall pushed him backwards. It only took him eight minutes, but when Alex reached the top, he was the first to free solo this route in the 34 years since it was established. There's only a handful of people who can actually do that with a rope. And the idea that he's doing that without a rope, you know, that, that's, that's an amazing thing to even consider. The next day, he was ready to tackle Sentinel's 1,600-foot face. I mean, basically, you follow that sunshade line all the way up to the middle of the wall. And, then yeah. and showed us his plan for the route. Over the past few weeks, he'd climbed Sentinel with ropes and climbing gear twice to prepare, scouting out the best places for his hands and feet. Then he hiked for nearly two hours just to reach the base of the climb. We watched him on a video monitor from half a mile away. How tough is this as a climb? Very. <laughs> Nobody's ever soloed the North Face of Sentinel before. Nobody's ever thought about doing it before. Go rock climbing. So he's on. Look at that. He's, he started. Yeah, he's off. It's pretty spectacular. So you almost have to, like, just stop and remind yourself. I mean, he is up there with nothing. Yeah, no rope. Nothing. Nothing. Right when he pulls into that crack, that's like the point of no return. It becomes world class right there. And he's, he's in it now. I don't even like the sound of that, the point of no return. Well, you don't, you're not going to reverse it. It's too hard. That's, that's, the, that's the one thing you got to understand on these things. Yeah. Once it gets to this level, the only way off is up. You're not, you're not going back down, it's just too difficult. I like to think that I know what I can and can't do. Sometimes when other climbers hear what you've been doing, they say it's unsustainable, which really is their code for, you know, you can't keep doing this and stay alive. It's not like I'm just pushing and pushing and pushing until, until something terrible happens. I mean, 
I don't know. I just I don't look at it like with that perspective. But maybe that's why it's dangerous for me. You know, maybe I'm like too close to it and I can't tell that I'm like speeding towards a cliff. I mean, I don't think that I will continue to do this forever. But I don't think that I'll stop because of all the risk and all that. I think I'll stop because I'll just lose the love for it. As he approached one of our fixed cameras, Alex grabbed a tiny piece of rock and pulled himself up. In this position, most of his weight is on just four fingers. Here's another one of the really difficult time parts right here. You can see him, like the, his fingertips are only going into the first digit, like the line on your hand. Literally, that's what he's only, clinging only, on with his only fingertips. To there. One thing every free solo climber fears is water. It seeps out of cracks in the mountain, and that's what Alex ran into halfway up Sentinel. Yeah, see how he's wiping his feet off like that? Yeah. See, on his legs? Yes. It's wet. That's not good now, at that's all. That's the worst of all things, of possible things. It looked like your shoes did get wet. Yeah, my shoes did get wet. So the, the big fear would be that like, you step on, or you like, climb through wet rock, and then without knowing it, you put your foot onto something, you know, and then you just slip right off it. That would be like the worst case scenario, like thinking that you're going to step onto some foothold and then just having your foot blow off. His wet shoes didn't seem to bother him. Take a look at him as he climbed up to another one of our fixed cameras. He's so relaxed, even at this height. From up here, 80-foot pine trees below look like grass. And yes, he is whistling. Then came the toughest 50 feet on Sentinel and the hardest sequence of moves he had to make. If he moved too slowly, his arms would give out, but if he rushed, he could slip and fall. It's a position Alex says he lives for. Where he's right now, that, this, is, this, is, this is the crux of the biscuit, as they say, the hardest part. And, uh, because look at what he's holding on Yeah, well, there isn't anything. Looking, it's also it's really just... steep right there. You can't, nobody, even Alex Honnold, can't, can't hang indefinitely on his arms. They're going to give out. And then he's got to have the strength to pull himself up. Yeah. And he's got to have, and, and the footholds aren't very good, so he's got to basically paste his feet on, you know, over the ceiling and hope they stick. Alex somehow clings to the wall. As the camera moves away, you can see the river half a mile below him. He's through the worst of it. And from here, it's 400 feet of what he calls easy climbing. So I go to the tippy top? All the way to the top in just an hour and a half. The first thing he did before talking to us was take off his shoes. Oh, okay. Hey, Alex. Yes? How's the view up there? The, the view is awesome, actually. I'm way psyched about the view. And the light right now is awesome. And, and all these other cliffs look amazing. Alex Honnold has just set another record. But for him, there'd be no celebration. Just a two-hour hike down the easy side of the mountain. When we return, swimming with great white sharks without a cage. There's no animal that we fear more and understand less than the great white shark, in part because it's so hard to get near them. So studying great whites hasn't been easy. But back in 2009, while on assignment for 60 Minutes, CNN's Anderson Cooper met one man who has spent his life getting closer to great whites more often than anyone else. His name is Mike Rutson, and in South Africa, where he lives, he's known simply as the Shark Man. What he's discovered about these predators will surprise you. Far from being mindless killing machines, Rutson believes great whites are smart, curious, and not out to kill humans. And he's willing to risk his life to prove it. Mike Rutson is looking for a great white shark he can swim with. That's right, swim with. Before he gets in the water, he needs to find a great white that's both calm and curious, a shark he refers to as a player. It's a player. What's a player? 
Well, Playa is basically the shark that's so relaxed, has a nice personality, woke up on the right side of the reef. And on the right it, side of the reef. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the animal's willing to interact with us. It's so curious. Rudson says great whites have personalities. They may be the top predator in the sea, but he says they are not the man-eating killers of our nightmares. Now how, how can you tell that's a player? Look how she's moving. She's checking everything out. Check now slowly she's going to do this. See how she looks at everything. Wow, yeah, yeah. It's moving very moving slowly around the boat. Very slowly. Check it's going to come and watch the motor now. That's what you want. So this is a curious shark. You, you can work with this shark. This is a player. This shark and several others have been attracted to Rutson's boat by chum, a mixture of bait and fish blood. It's believed great whites can smell a single drop of blood from a hundred yards away. My camera. Now that he's found a player, Rutzen and his cameraman, Mornay Hardenberg, suit up and prepare to do the unthinkable, plunge into bloody water with great white sharks all around. There's no universities to teach you what these animal social dynamics are and social behavior is. And the only way to find that out is by getting into the water. Immediately, a curious great white comes straight at Rutzen. His only protection, his camera. Rutzen has figured out that great whites don't like the feel of metal. Good visibility is crucial. The sharks are constantly circling, and Rutzen has to continually turn around so they don't sneak up on him. They are extremely inquisitive creatures. I like to say they like little kids in a toy store, and you just tell them, don't touch. Observe, they'll touch. The problem is, when, when they get curious, they, they sometimes bite. Yes, the animals are not trying to actively kill you, they're trying to outwit you. And there's a difference. And you're trying to outwit them again. So there's a mental battle going on, or a mental game being played between you and the shark? I believe so, yes. I mean, that seems like the ultimate test of putting your life on the line. I would like to think that it's the ultimate trust between the animal and myself. Rutzen is not a scientist. He was born on a farm and knew nothing about sharks until 20 years ago, when he began working as a fisherman along this rugged coast near Cape Town. These waters are home to the world's highest concentration of great whites. This is the hotspot in the world for great whites. A perfect hotspot because it's an ideal feeding ground for great whites. It's not far from the southern tip of Africa where the Atlantic and Indian Oceans meet. The water is rich in nutrients which attract whales, huge shoals of fish, and seals, some 60,000 of them. Seals are a prime target for great whites. Early one morning, Rutzen takes us to an area called Shark Alley. The seals pass through here, searching for food. There are plenty of fish in the sea. Why, why are the sharks so interested in the seal? The reason for that is the blubber. Marine mammals have a blubber layer, and that blubber, whoa! Big shark. <laughs> that blubber layer is extremely energy rich. Whoa! Oh my God! <laughs> That's Whoa. what we're talking about. The sharks leap straight out of the water, stunning the seals before devouring them. Seals are mammals. They're quick, agile, and smart. But as Rutzen has learned, they're no match for the power, speed, and intelligence of the great whites. They have to outsmart the seal. They. If they weren't as smart or smarter than a seal, they wouldn't have eaten. Watching great whites hunt has become a big business in this part of South Africa. Each year, tens of thousands of tourists flock to the town of Hansbai. They're offered a close encounter with great whites from the safety of an underwater cage. That was, that was really something. Rutzen started his own dive operation 17 years ago. Began as a business, but has become a mission, an effort to learn about great whites and dispel the myths surrounding them. I think that humans like to fear these animals and not understand these animals. Each year, as many as 70 million sharks are slaughtered to make shark fin soup, a delicacy in Asia. This undercover footage shows how fins are cut off while the sharks are still alive their bodies are thrown back into the sea. If people can just see these animals for what they really are, I'll be happy because then they have a chance of survival. By diving without a cage with the sharks, Rutzen is trying to show that there are a lot more complex animals than previously thought. After every dive, he spends hours reviewing his material, 
trying to make sense of how the sharks interact with him. What are you doing with your body here? The smaller you make your body, the lesser threat you are and then the animals should come closer. The bigger you are, the more threatening you are. Rutzen believes that the great white is extremely selective about what it eats and insists he is not on their menu as long as he stays calm and shows the shark that he has no fear. So it's important to stand your ground. The most important thing is don't chase the animals, don't run away from the animals, stand your ground and keep eye contact with the animal. Make eye contact. Make eye contact. It's not like a primate. If you're looking at it, it's already lost the element of surprise. Wow, look at this. No, oh, see? That you don't see every day. <laughs> you see the <laughs> oh eye? Oh, my God. People like to think it's this evil black eye of this great white. The eyes are actually the color of the blue sea. It's beautiful. Do you like blue-eyed blondes? There's a blue eye that you can't match. <laughs> I hope you've never complimented a woman by telling her she had eyes as pretty as a great white shark. <laughs> no, not yet. Great whites have been around for millions of years, but they've never been seen mating or giving birth. Their senses are highly developed, but when it comes to touch, Rutzen believes they often rely on their mouths. So it just uses its mouth to feel you, but that yeah. ends up being, could be a deadly yeah. bite. Touch is a very important sense for a living animal. So why shouldn't they use that sense? Rutzen believes most attacks by great whites on humans have been the result of curiosity, not deliberate acts of aggression. Worldwide, there were 12 deadly shark attacks last year, a tiny amount considering the millions of people who swim in the ocean. Rutzen says many of us have likely had a positive encounter with a shark without even knowing it. What do you mean by a positive encounter? It's where the animal comes to look at you sees you're not food, it's not what you're hunting, maybe very curious in what you're doing, look at you for a while and then move off again. You never know the animal's there, but the animal knows you are there. And that should tell people what? It would tell the people that these animals are not out to get us. They're not in our oceans to kill humans. Rutzen doesn't take tourist diving with sharks without a cage. But we've dived together before and he offers to take me for an up-close look at the great whites. No cage, no protection. On a perfect, calm morning, we head to Shark Alley. We drop anchor, and the chumming begins. It doesn't take long for the sharks to arrive. Reminded of the line in the movie Jaws, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. The fact we have a paramedic on board and an ambulance waiting on shore isn't exactly reassuring. They've been chumming the water for about 40 minutes now, and there's about four or five great whites circling the boat, searching for food. There's one in the water right there as we speak. So it's time to start the dive. Mike Rudson says the most important thing to remember when you're actually underwater with the great whites is to remain calm. It's easier said than done. Project confidence. That's what Mike Rudson recommends. I'm not exactly sure how to do that underwater with a wetsuit. Rudson and cameraman Mornay Hardenberg have been doing this so long, they're relaxed. My pulse is already high. Okay, how do you feel? Feel good. Feel good. Good may be an overstatement. Just remember, if I get eaten, just keep rolling. Because the only thing more stupid than being eaten would be to be eaten and not have it videotaped. Rutzen believes the sharks now circling the boat are players, curious and not too aggressive. It's an odd sensation knowing that you're about to jump into blood-filled, shark-infested water. Rutzen goes first, then I take the plunge. Immediately, a 15-foot great white swims straight toward us. Their size and power is awesome. They don't attack, they want to see what we are and circle us constantly. Up close, you see their razor sharp teeth and the strength of their bodies. It's terrifying but thrilling to be so close to such a massive predator. Seeing them in their own environment, not grabbing at bait or lunging at seals, gives me a new impression of them. A more complex picture, and that is exactly what Mike Rudson is hoping for. 
The current is getting stronger and visibility is deteriorating. So we decide it's time to surface. How's it going? It's unbelievable. It's terrifying and at the same time just exhilarating. And it's unlike anything else. Wow. In it. And I'm so happy I'm back up. That was great. Thank you. That was incredible. I'm glad I did it, but I'm not sure I'd do it again. As for Mike Rutson, he continues to push the boundaries. He sometimes even hitches rides on the dorsal fins of great whites. These interactions are stunning, but Rutson insists he's not being reckless. The more we work with him, the more careful we are because of the knowledge. It's not that we're getting complacent because we have done it so many times. You're we're more getting... careful with them now than you were when you started. Yes, because we are learning small things of what makes them tick. So we are so careful not to do the wrong thing. You did say before, though, when we talked, that you, know, you expect to die at a young age. Yeah, well, <laughs> look at my lifestyle. I smoke too much, I drink too much, and I drive my car very fast. <laughs> but you, so you don't expect to die from a great white? No, no. Go to 60minutesovertime.com to see more extreme athletes in action including Olympic gold medalist Sean White. I'm Steve Croft. We'll be back next week with a brand new edition of 60 Minutes.